I was like, right, so if anyone's going to celebrate, um, you know, my wedding and so on, I would like Muhammad Munir to be the one, the person singing because, you know, don't necessarily have that or had at the time the connection with Munir. But so after the Musalsal, he did in Ramadan, he did this, this uh, which is another disaster. Um, yeah. <laughs> Al-Mughani, um, where he portrayed that Nubians happily and
hello and good evening. Um, I suggest we wait a little bit because I think the other panel is still running and maybe some people want to jump over. Right, so let's wait maybe a couple of more minutes. I suppose you can all hear me. Um, and the chat is already open. Yes, we can hear you, Vincent. Okay, great. Hey, Solange. <laughs> Do you prefer with video or not? Um, well, whatever you like. I mean, when you have the video on, you will be in the recording, I think, of the video. And I'll see you moving at the top of my screen. Um, if it's heavy on your connection, you don't have to do it. Uh, um, I'll just pop in. Sure. Hey. And mute myself. Thank you. I'm loving this class. I'm so happy, Solange. I'm so happy you're here. Me too. Me too. <laughs> All right, and here's Dan. There are a few people that I expect to come, so I just don't want them uh, to miss out. But I think we'll, we should start because we actually have quite a bit today. All right, I don't think the other panel is actually um, ending anytime soon. So I'm just gonna start and then at some point I think they'll switch they'll switch the Facebook feed over. I don't know exactly how that works, but uh, I'm sure they'll, they'll make it happen. Um, so let me go to my slides. All right. Well, good evening and uh, welcome to the third uh, class in the Old Nubian Crash Course during Nubia Fest. Um, my name is Vincent van Gerven Uy and um, today, we are going to talk about a bunch of topics. Uh, we're going to talk about quantification, predication, and person uh, marking and personal pronouns. Um, so let, let's get started um, with quantification. So quantification um, is when you quantify something, right? So when you say like every day or all the people or five oranges or uh, no music at all, that are, those are all forms of quantification. And so quantification is something that you do with a, um, with a noun phrase. Oh, let me allow this person in. Quantification is something that you do with a noun phrase. Um, oh, and Vince, oh my God, more and more people are coming, even maybe more than yesterday. <laughs> um, all right. And so in Old Nubian, you can uh, classify um, the quantifiers by the way that they behave morphologically. And what does it mean? Well, it means that you can classify quantifiers based on how they relate uh, to the noun that they go with. So you have a predicative quantifiers. Um, they go with a noun that is marked with a predicate marker alpha, like uh, this one. And I'll show you some examples uh, later on. Um, you have nominal quantifiers, and these behave like nouns themselves. So when they are combined with another noun, uh, you need a genitive, right? So this is some type of like a possessive relationship. Um, when you're dealing with adjectival quantifiers, um, they behave like adjectives. And we saw adjectives... Uh, um, we saw adjectives already yesterday, and they usually follow uh, the noun, but there's actually one adjective quantifier that precedes the noun. And I don't know why, but it just likes to uh, go in front. 
And then you have independent quantifiers. And independent quantifiers, um, they don't take any noun at all. They can only appear on their own, right? So something like everyone. Also, for example, in, in English, the, the quantifier everyone is what you could call an independent quantifier. It cannot take any noun to go with. You cannot say everyone human. You have to say every human, right? So um, let's have a look at some examples of how these things look in uh, in Old Nubian. And I just plunked, I just plucked these out of uh, you know some of the texts. So we have, for example, uh, a predicative quantifier here, uh, Tauka Mishano in all time. So we have our word for time here, talk, um, with a predicate marker. And then we have our quantifier here that is following it. Um, we have each day. Um, here we have our uh, quantifier each, durtal, and our word for day. And here it behaves like a noun. So actually what you're saying is something like each of the day. And actually, for example, in English, you have the same thing, right? So like each of the days. Um, then we have um, here an adjectival uh, quantifier, is. And as you can see, it behaves like an adjective. In this case, actually, uh, it behaves like an adjective with restricted reading uh, because it, it goes in front of the noun Irkana uh, kingdom. So another kingdom. Uh, most other uh, adjectival quantifiers like a or some or the entire or all, they all follow. Um, note also, and you may have seen this already in some other examples, and I'm not going to talk about this a lot, but uh, sometimes um, you will see again this like vowel hanging hanging off the end of a word, and you may wonder like what is that vowel doing there? It's usually an u or an e vowel. Um, and um, this has to do with the fact that um, Old Nubian has restrictions on the consonant in which a word can end. So when you have a word like is and nothing else follows behind it, uh, no case marking, uh, uh, no topic marker, uh, uh, it doesn't connect to anything else, um, and it ends in a sigma, in, a, in an S sound, then that's not allowed. Uh, uh, in general, Old Nubian doesn't like words ending in an S. In fact, it only likes words ending in a vowel or in an L, R, or N. Anything else, or M, M is also fine. So like a liquid, basically a liquid sound um, or a vowel. Everything else is like, no, I would really like to have, you know, a vowel thing behind it. And so that's what you see here. Another example is, for example, the word cosmos here. Um, it's a Greek loan word and it ends in Greek in a sigma, in cosmos. Um, but in Old Nubian, you will always see it written as cosmosi when it appears on its own without any case marking at the end. And that is because Old Nubian doesn't like an S sound at the end of the word. Um, and here we have uh, uh, another, actually another adjectival uh, quantifier, wato, and here we see it coming after uh, as a regular adjective. And then finally, here we have an independent quantifier, Shuigul, uh, uh, some people, and you cannot really modify it in any other way. Uh, you can you can probably add a relative clause, um, but you cannot add another noun. By the way, for those uh, who just joined us, also I think on Facebook, uh, people will now be able to um, see this live stream. If you have any questions, you can ask them on Facebook and I'll magically understand them uh, through a complex uh, relay system, or you can ask them here in the chat. And um, when I see them, I don't see them always immediately. When I see them, I'll try to answer them. Um, all right, so let's look at some real life examples. This looks completely daunting. Um, Actually, I don't think I actually ex I have explained in the previous days how to how to read these things. Uh, I just jumped into them and I didn't really explain what what this actually is. So so let me do that for those who have never seen such a presentation of a sentence. So what this looks like is um, well, you have the example number, um, and then you have an abbreviation of the text from which the example is taken. And in this case, it's L, and that is the lectionary text that we saw 
I think in the first uh, I showed you a picture in the in the first uh, in the first class. Then um, what follows is usually a page number. Um, in this case, um, the the manuscript has page numbers on it, and so that's the page numbers that we use, and it's page 107. It doesn't mean, unfortunately, that we have 107 pages of this manuscript, but we have like I don't know 20 or something, uh, and and 107 is one of the pages that we have, uh, followed by line numbers. Um, then what follows here is actually something that shouldn't be here, but it's it's a symbol that I've used. It's, it belongs to a set of symbols that I introduced in my grammar that gives you a sense of how certain I am of the reading uh, that follows. Um, very often, uh, and, and I don't think I actually have, a, I've, I've scrapped these out of the other examples because it's just confusing maybe, but very often, now that it's here, very often, um, as you can see, the text has gaps in them, right? So this is reconstructed, this is reconstructed, this is reconstructed, this letter is not very clear, this letter is not very clear. And so um, in order to avoid making uh, or, or drawing very strong conclusions based on a single example, um, I have always marked my certainty of the reading uh, um, of, of the manuscript so that you know like on what a little bit on what empirical basis you're making certain judgments right so in this case um we are talking about um a predicative quantifier marking a relative clause and so the question is you know is 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 this a clear example of a construction like that um, and so what I do here is I say, well, the context of this whole thing is not very clear, right? Because we have reconstruction here, reconstruction here, this is reconstructed. But overall, actually, our, um, um, our relative clause, uh, this one, and I'll discuss how that works in a minute, this one is clearly readable. And actually, this quantifier here is also pretty okay because there, there is just no other word that starts like this. And so we are pretty sure that this is a good quantifier and that this is a relative clause because this whole thing can be read. And so the judgment is, well, the context is not completely 100% clear, but what I'm going to discuss about this sentence that is clear. And so that's kind of how I've introduced these types of uh, um, symbols. Now, the actual example is, is written in the Old Nubian script. Um, but very often linguists uh, don't read foreign scripts because they only read English. And so there is, uh, or they only read Roman script. And so there is a, uh, a Roman transcription right here, which follows like a specific key in which every single Nubian character is, is uh, transcribed or sorry, transliterated by uh, a single um, character from the, from the Latin alphabet. And then you see these little hyphens in there, which indicate uh, morpheme boundaries. And so morphemes are the smallest meaningful elements in the language. Um, and they are, let's say, the little Lego bricks of, of these larger things that are called words. Um, and then we have a glossing underneath. And the glossing gives you uh, a little bit of a code of what the thing, of what these little morphemes are. And in the case of Old Nubian, since it is a language that mainly has suffixes, usually what you have is the first thing that you encounter is, is, is your lexical item. It's the thing that carries the meaning of the word. And then what it follows, especially with verbs like this verb here or this verb here, or there's another big verb here, is a whole bunch of morphemes that gives you all kinds of other information about what that verb really is and what it's doing and you know who is, who is it affecting and what is its position in the sentence. And um, that, that's what we'll talk about tomorrow with verbs. Um, and then finally, uh, there is a translation. Now, this is not really literary translation. It's a translation that tries to render the syntactical structure of the Old Nubian as faithful as possible, but it should also be beautiful and it should also be understandable English, right? So you really, you know, try to convey something about this sentence uh, in the English language. Um, it, is, it is not a literary translation and it certainly is not a good translation by any standard, but let's say it's the most functional one. Um, it's the most functional one that you can, can invent uh, here without, you know, and, and understand something about this sentence, even if you don't speak Old Nubian or read Old Nubian. And then in this case, it's a Bible quote. And so 
for those who are interested, you can check this up in the Bible and then you'll find something in Greek um, that looks like this, uh, or at least it has a, a meaning that is, that is similar. So um, now that I've actually explained to you how these examples work, and I'm, I'm actually sorry I didn't do that before. Um, it's probably because I assumed, I see so many of them that I sometimes forget, you know, that this is not an obvious thing to understand. Um, let's look at um, this predicative quantifier here, which I marked in red, and which takes uh, a relative clause, right? So it's in this case, everything you gave me, right? That's what we have here in the sentence. Now they know that everything you gave me, I gave all to them. And so everything you gave me is this thing here in the Old Nubian, Aika Denjisina uh, Mishanka. And you see here that as with nouns, this quantifier marks its entire relative clause with a predicate marker. And so this is really quite nice that it does that. Um, as we will see in just a bit, um, a predicate marker usually marks the main verb of the clause. Um, and do we have uh, such a main verb? Yeah, it's right here, right? And so we see a predicate marker at the end, this A, and it marks the uh, main verb of the clause. Um, here we also have the A, but it, it's not because it's a main verb, but it's because, it, because it's in the scope, because it precedes this, uh, this quantifier here, which always uh, has this A attached to the, to the noun, or in this case, the relative clause that it governs. Um, right. So be aware, you know, like Old Nubian doesn't work like in European languages where you have, you know, all these fused morphology on the end of your verb. And once you have the verb, you pretty much know what's going on um, or don't because it's super irregular. Um, in Old Nubian, it's really like you have these really these blocks and, you know, every block is there for a reason. And in this case, this block is here because of this quantifier here. Um, now, these quantifiers um, behave like, you know, any other uh, quantifier in natural language and um, universal quantifiers. So quantifiers that say something like all or every or each. Um, in, in every human language have the tendency to move to the beginning of your phrase. Um, in semantics, it is thought that quantifiers do this always, but it's not always, um, uh, let's say, uh, uh, mirrored in the actual sentence structure on the surface, the, the, the structure that you see or read or hear. Uh, in Old Nubian, actually, um, we do see these universal quantifiers like all and every move to the beginning of the sentence um, as in this case right so all living beings who believe in me do not die until eternity so if this were like the previous example we would expect um, our universal quantifier to come right here after the relative clause you know those who believe in me um, but it does not it precedes it um, and when it does that, when it moves to the beginning of the clause, um, it is marked with this specific uh, emphatic marker, uh, sin. And so whenever you see that and there's a quantifier that is attached to it, you're like, ah, this thing has moved and it has moved to the beginning. And so I should, I should think of it as belonging somewhere else. And then you can figure out where that else, else place is. Um, in this course, we will not really go into like heavy syntax of Old Nubian because it's a really, um, it's not an easy subject. And it's also, it's also sometimes difficult actually to, to figure out because all the text or most of the texts that we're working with are translations. And so it can be that the, that the original language influences uh, uh, the, the Old Nubian in, in which it is translated. And so you cannot really trust whether all the syntax that you're seeing is, is let's say natural. Um, we don't know even whether this syntax that you're seeing right here is, is natural or is maybe like a literary invention. Maybe you really cannot say this in, in everyday speech. Um, so that's why we don't, we're not really uh, discussing this in depth. And you know things like this sin particle or, or, or suffix are really kind of crazy in the way that they uh, attach to certain noun phrases. And, and, and sometimes it means that things are moved around, as in this case. Sometimes it means that there's an emphasis going on. Sometimes we really don't know why it's there. Um, 
maybe, yeah, no, we don't know. And, and one of the many things that we don't know. In fact. All right, so have, let's have a look at predication. So we saw a bit of predication here, right? So, so this thing here, this A and this A right here, they are called predicate markers uh, for a reason because they deal with predication, right? And so that's, that's what we're gonna discuss right now. So um, usually when we talk about predication, um, we split this up in verbal and nominal, right? So verbal predication is predication by means of a verb, uh, as in the, the examples that you see on the screen. Um, and in case of nominal predication, this is usually done um, by means of a nominal predicate. And so, for example, in English, then you always need a copula, like the verb to be. But in many languages, you don't need such a thing, right? You can just clunk two things together, like man, sailor, and that basically means uh, the man is a sailor. Um, and as we will see in a bit, Old Nubian actually can do both. So let's first have a look at uh, the verbal predicates. Um, the main verbal predicate of a clause is always marked with an alpha. When I say always, there should be like a small star and then say like exceptions apply. And I'm not gonna discuss all the exceptions, but like, you know, 90% of the cases, it is marked with an alpha. And 90% of the cases when you see an alpha, at the end of a verbal form, then it's probably the main verb of your sentence, right? Not in all cases, as we just saw in the example, but in this, in 90% in of the cases it is. Um, so let's see here. Um, Apogelon pessina, this is, I just made up this, uh, this example, or maybe actually I took this from the Miracle Semina. Maybe this is the one that I made up. In any case, um, it is, it is something that is based on something found in the wild. Um, and we have the predicate marker here at the end, signaling this is the main verb. Um, when we're dealing with a, a subordinate clause, this alpha is absent, um, as you can see here, apogolon pessin, while the Bozeman speaks, right? So a while clause is, is introduced, is in English also a subordinate clause, right? It is a clause that, falls underneath a main clause. Um, and in Old Nubian, unless there's anything else like conjunction or any other marker going on, um, you will translate, you know, what you would call like a bare subordinate clause with, without anything else, just no A um, with while. And we will talk more about all the different types of subordinate clauses uh, on Friday. Now, um, when we have a nominal predicate, um, you see basically the same thing, right? We have again our subject here, the boatsman, um, and we have a noun. The boatsman is a man. I'm, I'm very sorry about this. Hor I mean, they, these are super obvious, like boring sentences. Um, uh, also completely focused on like male dominated discourses. And I'm, I apologize for that. Um, but uh, I, I, will, I, will, I will do better. <laughs> Um, so here we see um, that the nominal predicate man is marked with the uh, predicate marker. So the boatsman is a man. And then what happens, and we'll discuss this on Friday, uh, is that nominal predicates also usually get this focus marker attached to it. Now, um, when we are dealing with a uh, subordinate clause, um, then we find the auxiliary. So you cannot say apogilon ogj or ogic, and that means while the boatsman is a man. Uh, you need, in this case, an auxiliary, uh, and you will find it right here. The, 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 the nominal predicate is still marked with the predicate marker, but your verbal predicate, let's say here, or your, your copula, as you would call it, is not marked with an alpha, right? Because this is a verb that indicates we're dealing with a um, subordinate clause. Um, now, the, the predicate marker is really quite interesting uh, because, I, as I said, um, I think yesterday, all the morphology, like cases, uh, all the verbal morphology, it always comes on the right edge of your phrase, right? It is never repeated. It doesn't distribute. It always just comes, you stack it at the end. This predicate marker, uh, A, 
is the only thing that is distributive. So it's the only thing that distributes across your phrase. Um, and it does this both in the verbal domain, as in this case, the boatsman listens and speaks, um, where both these verbs have this alpha, and in the nominal domain, right? So if you would say something like the boatsman is a Christian man, um, then you would find the alpha on both your adjective and your noun. And so this is kind of interesting because it's, it's the only suffix in Old Nubian that, that has this specific property. Uh, and we don't know why, but that's how it works. Um, now here, maybe to go back, you saw that there are two verbs in this sentence, right? There's a verb to hear um, or to listen and a verb to speak. And we see that both are marked with the alpha. So uh, we know that they're both part of this verbal predicate. But one of them has a tense and person marking right here. And uh, one of them doesn't. And so this specific form is, is an important feature of Old Nubian grammar. And we call them converbs. So a converb is a verb without person or tense marking, but with a, a predicate marker. And its interpretation always depends on the tense, person, and aspect marking of the main verb. So again, this is the example that we just saw. Um, we have uh, the verb uh, to listen or to hear, and we have the verb to speak. And this verb here is interpreted on the basis of the tense, person, and aspect marking on the main verb, right? Um, which means it's third singular and it's present tense, right? That's what's said here, or second, third singular and present tense. And we know it's third in this case because we have an explicit subject, which is a third person. Um, they usually come on their own, but like if you are in, in, in storytelling mode, um, if you're in storytelling mode, um, then you can actually really concatenate these things along. And so what is interesting is that in most um, of the old Nubian texts that we have, literary texts, you usually see what you saw in the previous example. So you see one converb and then the main verb. However, in the miracle of Saint Mina, which is usually indicated with M, there are sentences where you have like three or four of these forms one after the other. And uh, it gives the whole narrative a very dynamic feel, right? So what, what is happening here is, uh, well, I'll just read the translation. When he saw it, when he saw it, he ran to the image of Mary Theosokos and shouted. Um, or if you want to even be more literal, he ran and went and shouted and spoke, you know, something like this. So you can, in English, you really cannot do this. And that's why I have conflated some of the meetings in the translation. But, but what happens in the Nubian is really that you have the running and then the coming and then the shouting and the speaking, right? And so all of these things happen one after the other. Um, you can say in English, for example, something, he came running and spoke shouting, right? Something like that. It, it sounds a little bit stilted. Um, and so in like in, in a narrative, this is a very effective way to to tell like, you know, uh, let's like say an onrush of events. And 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 this these converbs and you know the way that they are used one behind the other also signal one of the high points in the whole narrative, right? So this is this is the big scene in which the boatsman that has eaten the egg that he was supposed to donate to the church, he sees the he suddenly sees Saint Mina inside in this church on this horse with this shining armor and this huge spear. And he is like running to this icon. He's like running for safety. Um, and, um, and then of course he's confronted by the saint uh, whom he cannot outrun and, uh, and the, the story um, continues. So we have here another one. Um, this is after um, Saint Mina, uh, has confronted the sailor, um, has recovered his uh, chicken and is bringing the chicken to the woman who originally wanted to donate the egg. Um, and so here we again, we have the scene, Say Minas uh, went to the house of that woman, knocked on the door and called her. So again, we have this, you know, arrival, 
he is driving, he's going to this house, he's knocking on the door, he is calling the woman. So there's again a bunch of actions that happen at the same time uh, or like rep in rapid sequence. And we see again that Old Nubian uses like these converb construction right here. So one, two, three converbs, and then the main verb with our past tense marker, our person marker, and the marker of the, uh, the alpha marking the main verb. And so all of these verbs here, they're all interpreted with this tense and person, right? Um, the good thing is, is that the converb always precedes the main verb. It's never the other way around. So whenever you see a converb, whenever you see this naked verbal root with only an alpha, you just have to skip ahead a little bit and then you'll find the main verbs and you, you'll know how to interpret it. Um, so Ahmad al Haj asked me, uh, how are verbs sequenced in such an example? Um, you mean uh, is whether there is a logic behind them? Um, I suppose that, that that is the logic of the story, right? Um, uh, if I understand your question correctly. So here we first have the saint is going, he's leaving the church, then he's coming to the house. And then once he's at the house, he has to knock on the door of the gate. You know, he has to knock on it uh, and he is shouting out, you know, uh, woman, I have your chicken here. Uh, please accept this and release it among your chickens. Um, so I suppose that the logic of the uh, uh, of the story dictates in which order these converbs are placed. Another uh, aspect that may be important is that converbs often modify the main meaning of the verb that they uh, precede. Right. So you can see this here with this uh, uh, ua pesna, um, where the regular verb here is speaking and then the converb to shout gives us a more, uh, a more uh, let's say, detail about the way in which it is spoken, namely by shouting. And the same thing actually you could hold for this couple here. It's like um, the man is coming to the icon and the way in which he's doing that is by running. Right, so there is some type of, let's say, adverbial modification going on uh, uh, in convert constructions. Um, so Solange writes, um, I was introduced to converbs in studying Goes, and I believe that they are also present in Egyptian language, but not NSI as such. I have heard this is a particular in African verb form, is that right? So, um, well, converbs do occur quite frequently in African languages across language families. And this is true. And most of the descriptions of converbs come from African languages, but not only. Um, this appears also in Sinitic languages, in many Southeast Asian languages, in Polynesian languages. Um, I, I imagine this also happens uh, in, 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 uh, in languages on the American continent. Uh, it's just that it doesn't really happen in Indo-European languages. Um, but it's it's pretty much uh, it's it's pretty much well attested uh, everywhere else, right? So so what is what is funny is that we often, or at least you know, linguists often take their native language, which is very often in the European languages, as some of the baseline of their judgments about what is common and what is not common. Whereas Indo-European is a weird, weird ass family that does really, really weird things that you wouldn't do in any other language family anywhere around the world. Like English is the worst baseline of a language that you can imagine. Like this is not okay. Um, uh, Old Nubian is much more representative of languages of the world than English will ever be, uh, simply in terms of its typological features. So. Uh, things like ancient Greek or something. This is like, I mean, with all these irregularities, like it's not Georgian, but it's, you know, it's, it's not far off in its, in its weirdness. Um, also, when you look at, you know, for example, the, 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 the vowel systems of Dutch, for example, which is my native language, they're just like out there. Um, so, so it's, you know, we always, or at least I think linguists really have to be careful with making these judgments of what is what is common and what's not common, uh, because we are so skewed to our own, you know, our own, our own linguistic environment, um, that actually what we think is completely exotic between quotation marks is actually like super normal, like 
of course you have 20 cases. Of course you have like 500 genders. I mean, why would you only have two? Like, you know, this, right? So this, <laughs> uh, uh, for a Bantu speaker, like a French, you know, masculine feminine distinction is like, you only have two, like what language is that, right? So, so it's, it's, it's really, um, it's, it's, it's really subjective uh, in that sense. Although, I mean, there are good, um, there are good catalogs of, you know, typological features and then you can actually see, okay, well, there are about hundred languages that do this and like 2000 that don't. And so that gives you kind of an idea of, you know, how rare a certain linguistic feature is. I forgot the, the name, but there's this good linguistic atlas out there that, that tracks all these morphological features. Um, but converbs in African languages, yes, but also in a lot of other places. Yeah. I have to, I have to keep track of the time. It's already 36. Um, so let's see, I, I discussed this one. Um, right, so then we come to applicatives. So applicatives are um, a specialized form of the converb construction. So they only appear with uh, two verbs, donative verbs, uh, the verbs to give and to give. Uh, Old Nubin has two verbs for to give, one for giving to someone else and one for giving to me. Um, there are also other languages, for example, Japanese that have this distinction uh, between different languages for giving. Um, and when you combine one of these giving verbs like here and here with a converb, um, that means that you're doing the converb for someone else or for me. So in this case, the boatsman builds a house for the woman we have our subject here, our object here is house. Um, and here we have our um, applicative construction. So the converb gunya, no person marking, no tense marking, and our donative verb to give to someone else. And to give to whom? Well, to the woman. And if you remember from yesterday, this is an indirect object and it is marked with an accusative because the woman is animate. Yeah, it's, it's a living being. Um, when we direct the action to me, um, so the boatsman builds a house for me, then uh, we use a different donative verb because it is for me or for us. Um, and uh, we of course use a different indirect object, in this case, Aika, me. Um, we can also leave this, in this case, we can leave it out because the verb already indicates that the indirect object, that the, benefic the, the benefactor of the house building uh, is me. So that's why we put this between brackets. Solange, you want to say something or to yeah, write something? So that oh, yes. first, yeah, the first example, number 17, is the verb that you have highlighted in red, the tear, that the last consonant has changed to. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, okay. sorry, yeah, 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 this is correct. Yeah, sorry, this is, uh, of course, uh, yes, the last consonant has changed. So uh, this indeed is this verb here, to give to someone else. And it is correct, you see here that the N has assimilated. Um, this is a phonological thing that happens in Nubian um, with a certain class of verbs that end in R. Um, they are very sensitive at the end and they very frequently assimilate to the following consonant. And the verb to give is one of them. Yeah, so well spotted. I, I, didn't, I didn't explain that correctly. Yeah, you are, this is indeed with assimilation. There is a lot of other assimilation going on behind the scenes here and there and that I don't talk about uh, because again, it's a very complex uh, topic and it also deals with our analysis of stress in Old Nubian, which is not indicated in the writing, but which we can infer sometimes from assimilation patterns, but this is maybe for like a sequel or something, <laughs> if, I, if I survive this week. Um, right, and then we have the last topic for tonight, uh, which, is, which is person. Um, and so there's this nice table here. Uh, again, like on previous days, I will post the, uh, the slides on my Humanities Commons account and I'll dump them on Twitter and I'll add them to the YouTube video recording that I'm currently making. Uh, so I hope that this gets to you if you need it. And people have also already emailed me to ask for these slides and I've responded. So like if you somehow are unable to get these things and you need them, you can always send me an email. Um, 
So you see here, these are all the different ways in which Old Nubian can express person in a sentence. Um, so it, it has a set of personal pronouns like I, you, uh, he, she, well, he and she are the same pronoun, uh, which again is probably the most widespread thing in the world. Like why would you distinguish between he and she? That's like a ridiculous thing to do for a language. Um, it does, however, make the very sensible uh, distinction between inclusive plural uh, we and exclusive we. So the we that includes you or the we that don't. Um, I think this is a politically very useful form of we that uh, is unfortunately absent in the English language to the great detriment of its political system, I think. Um, and, uh, you know, you, plural you and, and, uh, and they. And so we have a bunch of nice pronouns. Um, we have these kinship possessors. Uh, there are only a few. We don't really have them for the plural, um, but they are a widespread phenomenon in nilo saharan languages and in, in uh, I, th I think also in other uh, English, uh, sorry, English African uh, language uh, phyli. Um, but in Old Nubian, the system is rather small. And then we have this bunch of really fun uh, subject clitics. Um, we have the regular subject clitics here. Uh, use in regular sentences. We have a specific subset that is used for imperatives. And then we have these, what I call old subject clitics, which are old uh, and they are falling out of use. And in, in documentary text, they're nowhere to be found. Um, and so this actually, the presence and frequency of these old subject clitics is actually a nice indicator for how old the text actually is. Um, yes, Solange, I will talk about the kinship possessor pronoun. So like, bear with me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will talk about all of these things. I won't just give you the table. I will actually give you examples. Um, um, so what are we starting with? We're starting with the subject clitics, right? So uh, we've already seen these at work in, in some of the verbal forms in, in the examples that we saw, right? Um, and so these subject clitics developed originally from independent pronouns that got incorporated into the verb. So um, we can still see the traces of that, right? So you originally have this uh, um, pronoun I for I, um, which is a lucky coincidence. Um, and the, the, the clitic version of that is this E. Um, we have an N that is used for the second and third singular, um, which the end we still find in the pronouns that are used in Midope. And the fun thing about Midope is, is that it is in some ways a very conservative Nubian language and it, in its pronominal system, it has preserved all the proto-Nubian forms. All the other Nubian languages have made all kinds of innovations. Um, but here we can clearly see that in these conservative forms, this N is present. Um, U and U, well, it, the, the relation is still very clear. And also this on that we see in the third plural is very close to what we have in our uh, Midope three plural pronoun with this ga probably that's a plural marker, right? So we have here quite clearly uh, a form that really looks like our, our Nubian subject critic. Now, what, what seems, I mean, there is this theory in nilo saharan that, and this, this works throughout all the languages in, in this phylum, is that we go through waves of independent pronouns being incorporated into the verb, then becoming these suffixes, and then slowly uh, deteriorating, losing their phonological features, becoming zero in the end. And then there's a new wave and there's a new wave. And so you can basically peel back the layers of these waves. Um, and that's also what you can actually see in Nubian, right? So we see here, let's say the, the archeological sediments uh, of of a, a previous incorporation of pronouns in, into your verb. Um, let's see what they, uh, how they work, uh, because this was also until recently not very well understood. Um, so Old Nubian is a pro-drop language, which means that it can drop its subject. Um, so when the subject is, uh, is uh, uh, clear from the verb, the referent, then you don't need to express it. Uh, you, you cannot do something like that in English, for example. You always need to have an overt subject. And in Old Nubian, you don't. Um, and these subject clitics are sensitive to whether you have a present or absent subject. So when the subject is absent from its, let's say, original position in the sentence, that's when you have the clitic. If the subject is in its original position, you don't. Um, 
and this is very clearly illustrated with um, a hypothetical uh, sentence. This is a full sentence. He, she, it speaks. There is no explicit subject. Um, so that's why I wrote this very big word gap here. Um, but we do have a uh, subject clitic, um, which has, which is right here, and it usually merges with this uh, present tense uh, morpheme. Um, we also find a subject clitic in the case we have a topicalized subject, because what does topicalization mean? We'll talk about this on Friday. Um, but one of the things it means is that your subject or whatever is topicalized in your, in your sentence is moved to the very beginning of the sentence. In other words, your subject is no longer where it used to be. That's why I wrote here gap, which is very untechnical and all um, uh, syntacticians will chastise me for being so untechnical about this. But we can basically say there's this gap here and because there's a gap, we find a subject critic. Uh, you can also just say, whenever I have a topicalized subject, I will find a subject clitic. Whenever I see no overt subject, I have a subject clitic. And this is, this is a strong correlation. Um, let's say 99%. <laughs> um, now, as I said, we have, these, we have a set of these older uh, subject clitics which survive for second singular and plural persons. Um, and they appear like, let's say, in the niche verbal forms, like verbal forms that you don't use very frequently. Um, they also appear on some nominal forms like you know, jussives and vedatives, like don't do that or may you do this and affirmative verb forms. So this is something that we again see very frequently in languages, right? So the, the, the forms that are less used are sometimes the most archaic ones because they are not used very often. And so they don't wear and tear, you know, like your regular old copula, right? So they're less sensitive to, 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 to deterioration. And so they're usually more conservative. And that's exactly what we see in Obnubian is that these, let's say, less frequent forms, maybe more formal forms, they keep this uh, second um, person subject clitics alive. Um, they no longer appear in, in modern Nubian languages. So this is really like the, the last time we see these guys. Um, so let's give one example um, of these, of these uh, old subject clitics in action. Um, you see them here. Uh, Thus brothers be zealous in prophecies and do not forbid the one who has spoken in tongues. Um, we see it here on brothers, right? So it, there's an appeal to you, brothers. Uh, that's when we when we find it. This is this is very frequent usage. Uh, we also find it on on beloved, which is a very uh, uh, frequent opening to in prayers. Oh, beloved, we find this cap, um, and you also see it here on this Yusuf Joseph form. Do not forbid. Um, we see it here as a as in a plural form. There are many other uh, variations of these uh, old clitics that are sprinkled all over the place, but we don't really have time to um, go through them now because it's close to eight and I don't want to go over time. We're going to rush a little bit to this last part, but it's not the most interesting part in any case. So we have two types of personal pronouns, uh, long ones and short ones. And again, this was a distinction that wasn't really considered until recently. Um, but it appears that there's really um, a, a functional difference between these uh, two sets of pronouns. And the difference, at least morphologically, is the fact that uh, long pronouns have this additional vowel at the end, usually u. So the short is i, and the long one is i u or, or i e. Um, and this, funnily enough, this is a distinction that still exists in Obin. So there is there's still this sense that you have longer and shorter forms of your pronouns. Um, and they appear in different syntactical environments. So uh, long personal pronouns are used uh, in emphatic conditions. This makes sense, right? You use the longer form when you want to emphasize something. Um, it's used in forms of address. Again, when you want to address somebody, it makes sense that you use the longer form. Um, they're used in contexts in which they're qualified. So, you know, oh, you uh, long people of the South, right? Then you would use a long personal pronoun. And they also form the basis for certain cases. Um, we can see this here, for example, in emphatic case, are you greater than God? Um, 
note that we don't that we already have a subject clinic here, right? So we don't we don't need this thing at all. Yet it is there, um, but it's clearly there for emphasis, and it's therefore it's also uh, a long form of the of the pronoun. Um, we have it here in an address. Um, Lord, if you had been here, right? So we're addressing the Lord. Um, if you had been here, uh, my brother would have not died. Um, here, if you, so here we have again our long form. And here in this case, uh, the personal pronoun is qualified, right? You alone. So here we find eru kolo. And we see also very nicely that again, this is our entire noun phrase, our case marking and our focus marking comes at the end of the entire phrase, right? So this thing is not a case marking or anything else. This is, this is literally the entire form. Um, short personal pronouns are used for uh, topicalization, for focus marking, um, subjects of nominal predicates, and also as the basis for all the other case markers. Um, so here we have a topicalized subject, Ion, not I U one. Um, I ask about them. Um, here we have a, a focus marked subject, Talo. And again, I will talk about the distinction between these two things on, on Friday. Um, again, we see Talo with uh, assimilation here from Tar to Tal um, for before this uh, L of the focus marker, right? So Tar Lo becomes Talo. Um, modern Nubian languages have many more of these cases. Like they assimilate, you know, they really like to do that. Oh, hello. <laughs> Babies also like to assimilate, by the way. Um, uh, it's, it's, uh, to disassimilate is, is definitely part of their language acquisition process. Um, and um, here we have um, the subject of a nominal predicate. Um, as you can see, they are altogether unjust, right? We have here, uh, where is our nominal predicate? Unjust, right here. Um, and so the subject of nominal predicates, when it's a personal pronoun, it's always in the short form. We don't know why, that's just how it is. Um, and then the kinship possessors. So we don't have many of them, um, but basically the system is, is that um, inalienable relations and those are usually family relations or body parts uh, in nilo saharan languages very frequently have these kinship possessors. Um, so these are like reduced personal pronouns that attach to the, to the left side of your kinship term, right? My father, your uncle, uh, his sister. And so these, these become really, let's say, uh, 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 glued onto them, right? So you have, Apple, my father, instead of something like an papo or something, or ipo, your father, right? So these are really uh, lexicalized forms um, that, that are specific to kinship terms, right? Because uh, it suggests that you cannot use a kinship term without, without actually saying whose it is. You cannot, you cannot talk about a uncle. You can only say his uncle, my uncle, your uncle. So you always have to be specific about whose family member you're referring to, um, which of course may have, you know, anthropological, uh, an anthropological background. Um, all right. And I think then that's um, it when the subject is overt. Yes, I talked about that. Yeah. Okay. So this is an example of where you have an overt subject. So no subject gap and no clitic, right? So only tense marking here. This must have been left behind in my rush this morning to compose this slideshow. All right, so that brings us at the end. Um, we have like five minutes for questions, um, either here or through Facebook, if Mazin can um, transmit these questions to me. Um, if there are no questions, you can ask them in the chat. Uh, Alexander is saying he was hoping that I would sing the Atiri example. Um, I don't know. Is uh, here is the Atiri example. Um, I, I cannot sing this. Um, 
Alexandros, I'm sorry. Um, for people that don't understand the background to this joke, um, I worked on this Atiri text together with Alexandros and, and many other colleagues uh, from, uh, from Rubiology to, um, to, to, to read and describe and analyze this text. And we had the theory that there's a certain metrical pattern in these sentences, like he overcomes the power hungry, he saves this and this people, he does so many beautiful things. We're talking here about Michael, the Archangel Michael. And, uh, but yeah, I, I cannot sing this. Alexandros, like, you will have to sing this if this is uh, something that you, uh, you want to hear. Um, wait, um, Dima says, no questions from Facebook. Um, says hello to everybody. Um, and Solange says, as I mentioned, I hope that Onubi can shed light on Meroitic. Anything like this term yet made in Meroitic? Um, well, I, I, am, I cannot do like instant Meroitic uh, etymology here <laughs> tonight. I'm sorry, that option has been switched off. Um, uh, uh, but yes, uh, of course, uh, knowledge of all the Nubian languages and all the North and East Sudanic languages will help us understand Neuritic better. Um, and that's unfortunately a very slow process because it means that we have to have very good descriptions of all these languages, not only of Nubian, but also languages such as Nara or Nimang or Tama, uh, all of that is necessary in order to arrive at a good reconstruction of Northern East Sudanic and then have a look again at Meroitic. And so this is, this is work that is uh, ongoing. Um, but everything, for example, that we understand, for example, these old subject critics, that may help us uh, understand something about Meroitic, right? Because if we, uh, if we are able to distinguish ancient features of a Nubian language that are no longer in modern Nubian languages, then perhaps these Asian features were also part of the proto-language. And so they would tell us in turn something about what we could possibly expect to find in Meroitic, right? But this is all very tentative, right? Uh, this is, none of this is, is uh, yeah, it's, it's all still uh, in research. All right. Um, well, thank you very much again for uh, joining me tonight. It is uh, three to eight. And so I'm gonna bid you farewell. I'll be back tomorrow at seven o'clock again with the verbal system, which is going to be like a real treat. Um, and um, I will upload the video again as soon as possible and the slides. And I hope to see you all together tomorrow again. And thank you very much for listening. Good night. <laughs>